uh, we walked around the uh, football, uh, baseball, look. basketball field uh, four times, and I did it. And uh, it was we nice. have another so winner. I should, I should do that more often, and I know I need to. And it helped me. I think it really did help me. Um, I think See, like, you that about that. they did it years ago. Yeah, yeah, I, know. I think as African Americans today, we don't do enough of it, and we should. And uh, I don't mind, you know, saying that. I don't mind doing it. But uh, you know, the young people, they should do it too. Seven zero three. Seven zero
So what can you take away from the African American Happy Flower Bench? Please share with others. Eat your vegetables. Uh, eat your eat your fruits. Just really pay attention to what you're consuming.
Chef Robert Edwards. I am here at the African American Health Expo 2014 in Pittsburgh, California. Um, just here, was invited by the executive director, Lynette Watts, to do a food demo and talk about African American eating habits and how we can improve them. But the way we eat now is currently killing us really fast. High blood pressure, diabetes, um, heart attack rates are high, cancer is high. So if we don't make a change soon, um, there's gonna be very few of us around. So not only for soul food, soul food, but soul food is the soul food conversation. So the conversation of people who cook soul food, who didn't have a lot of money, so therefore they fried the chicken and made the grits and made the greens and made the string beans and mac and cheese. Soul food for me is love, and it's the main ingredient. At home, we didn't call it soul food, we just called it dinner. <laughs> My family is from a small southern town called Milledgeville, Georgia. Food is a huge part of the culture in Georgia, especially what is now affectionately called soul food. Uh, what is that you're doing? I'm putting the foil around the edges of the pie crust so that when I put it in the oven, the edges won't burn. So I have all of these beautiful memories of my mother, sister, and me preparing and cooking soul food for our trips from New York to Georgia. We would wrap the food in foil and put it in brown paper bags. Looking back, those were some of the best times for us as a family. Soul food was a big part of our journey. We bonded as we drove south eating my mother's fried chicken. My parents told us stories about what it was like growing up in the Jim Crow South. As we crossed the Mason-Dixon line and made our way into the Deep South, my father would have my sister and me close our eyes and imagine what life was like during slavery. Driving past cotton fields on both sides of the highway, I would close my eyes tightly and visualize myself picking cotton from sunup to sundown. The stories my pops told my sister and me were powerful and made me wonder about the day-to-day -day lives of my enslaved ancestors. I've always heard horrible stories about slave traders feeding enslaved Africans the poorest quality foods. But if this were true, then how did they manage to survive the rigors of slavery? Slavery may have been racially based, but it was an economic proposition. It wasn't economic to put all those people in a ship and have them die. So you had to feed them enough of what they would eat so that they would survive the voyage, and the voyage was beyond horrific. So what the savvy slave trader did was to study his cargo and their culture. What do these people normally eat? And the best he could is reproduce that in the cheapest form possible. Basically, the enslaved might be fed corn, rice, or yams, depending on their point of origin. I often hear black people say that slaves ate from the bottom of the barrel. When I was young, my grandfather told me stories about his grandfather eating food out of hog troughs. Were stories like this fact or fiction? It's important to complicate the notions of soul food in the same way that it's important to complicate our notions of slavery, our notions of American history. Everything is inevitably 20 times more complicated than you thought it was going to be. There's so many mythologies that have accreted onto the idea of what black people were eating during the time of slavery. If one's grandfather said that his grandfather ate out of a trough in the slave pen, theirs may very well be a kernel of truth to that. But we're also hearing this story now from a grandfather who heard it from a grandfather. 
people who were being given a peck of cornmeal and a half pound of salt pork or three dried fish and a little bit of salt every week. How do you raise a community of women who are pregnant, who are lactating, and knee babies, and, <coughs> and men and women too, who are burning 3,000 calories a day? They can't live on what I just named. They can't. So we know they didn't. So what did they eat? Slavery wasn't a monolithic institution. It looked different in different parts of the um, Americas and the Caribbean in certain parts of the Caribbean, enslaved Africans were able to grow their own food and had Sundays off. You know, it wasn't this paternalistic system like it was in the Black Belt and the Deep South. Under some systems, they had provision grounds, and in the provision grounds, they were expected to grow their food. <coughs> Remember, slaves were responsible not only for growing their food, but in many cases, for growing the food for the entire plantation. They're giving slaves the bare minimum in order for them to exist and to work. Now, slaves are fighting against that. They're resisting by trying to provide food for themselves. So they're using a lot of the same hunting and fishing techniques that they did in Africa. The Tidewater region, slaves there are supplementing their diet with fishing, with crabs, crab cakes, and all those kind of things. The enslaved in the Low Country had rice in their diet. They had broken rice. The rice that wasn't able to be sold became a part of the diet. New Orleans is a very African city with, I would say, a thin French veil. The first wave of African people were coming from the Senegambia region of West Africa to New Orleans. Something else that these people brought was okra, which gumbo is actually the West African word for okra. And so the women, um, when they were disembarking off of the, the slave ships, um, people were finding seeds in their hair and they were actually okra seeds. New Orleans is interesting because although we're in the South technically, in terms of culture, we face more even south of us, to the Caribbean. So we find we got a lot in common with those cultures. We got seafood, obviously, with all the islands. Also, the kind of beans that are the heart of our food, very much common in, in this area south of us, not as common in Mississippi and Virginia and other places north of us. It's my argument that the slave quarters is influencing the big house more than the big house is influencing the slave quarters. It was black women who raised these white kids and these wealthy families. And they're feeding these kids their food. So they might make for the table some kind of special dish for this planter, but in the kitchen is where that little white boy is. Whatever household you came from in Mississippi and probably in the South, if you had sold food, you had some connection with African Americans in your family so that you learned how to cook those meals so that they taste really good. And so what happened clearly in the South and arguably in other parts of the United States and even more arguably throughout the hemisphere was that the hand of the African in the pot transformed the taste of the pot. Black people in the South during and after slavery took their food and seasoned it, battered it, fried it, baked it, smoked it, and canned it. With a pinch of this and a pinch of that, we turn survival food into a delicacy that people from all walks of life enjoy eating. But to further understand my pop's deep love for soul food, I decided to go back to the Deep South, Jackson, Mississippi. I wanted to get a better sense of just how entrenched the soul food tradition is to Southerners. While there, I went to an historically black college football game at Jackson State University. Here, there were thousands of black people having a great time. And where there are thousands of black people at a social event, there's got to be some soul food. As a northerner returning to my southern roots, these tailgaters reminded me that there's nothing quite like southern hospitality. The atmosphere felt like a family reunion. How long y'all been out here today? Yesterday, Y'all been out here since yesterday? Everywhere I turn, people offer me something to eat. Now, I don't know about you, but growing up, my father warned my sister and me to always accept a plate of food when we came down south, even if we weren't hungry. He said folks in the south would be offended if you didn't accept their food. I ran into these brothers who introduced me to their tailgate special. So tell me what you got inside the junk pot. Uh, <laughs> 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 
I want to do my best. And I will do my best. My pops would have loved Miss Peaches because she represents countless black women in the South whose food nourished folks like my dad with loving hands. So today's is um, how can we eat better? Okay, how can we eat healthier? And I will take this as an option. I have some people that don't eat vegetables that I know. I have some people that I know that only eat the vegetables that I cook. I have some people that don't eat vegetables whatsoever, okay? They believe vegetables, bad for you, literally. So what I've tried to do over the last eight years is try to cook fresh vegetables, show people how to cook them. Because most of the time we get our vegetables from cans. Okay, we're here in California, we're very, very blessed that we can have fresh vegetables year round. I just got back from two, New York two weeks ago. The leaves are falling, supermarkets are looking bare in regards to fresh vegetable. I mean, they still have corn and the corn is brown and they're still selling it. Here in California, that wouldn't fly, it wouldn't happen, okay? So understand that we are lucky, very lucky here because of the availability of fresh produce. So what I wanna do is take advantage of that fresh produce and talk to you guys about utilizing the fresh produce, okay? Earlier I was talking about a can of green beans, 770 milligrams of salt, per can, okay? If you cooked your own fresh vegetables, you don't have to worry about that sodium intake, okay? You cook it to your specifications. Some of us cook our vegetables till they're very, very soft like baby food. Some of us cook them halfway. Some of us don't cook them at all, okay? But at the end of the day, you are having vegetables. The question is at what point in the cooking process of the vegetable is the nutrition? Or you start losing the nutritional value of cooking your produce. When we cook it till it's soft, you've lost about 75% of your nutrients. It's now in your water. What do we do with that water? We dump it, right? We dump it with all the we dump it with all the nutrients. Okay? So what I push for is try your best to eat raw vegetables, carrots. You guys saw me snacking when you guys walked up. Raw carrots or blanch them, okay? You guys are probably asking, what does blanching mean? It's a culinary term meaning cooking your vegetables or whatever you wanna cook really fast, less than a minute. You bring your water to a boil, put a pinch of salt in the boiling water, your chopped vegetables, okay? You throw them in the water, you give them a stir, you pull them out, throw them in a container like this with cold water, it stops the cooking process immediately, okay? And this is carrots that I chopped earlier, okay? You see it has, still has a little fight to it. It's not, it's not mushy, okay? You gotta literally press hard and down for it to give way, right? So that's just, you know, carrots. Ideally, you wanna cut them to bite size and that's what I did right here. Blanch them, take them out, cold water, set them aside. So I did squash, I did carrots, um, I had yellow and green squash, so I did those three, I blanched. I added bell peppers, okay? Now the bell peppers, I kept whole. I didn't cook them, and I added that, I cut them small, added that for texture, okay? Now, flat leaf parsley. What do we normally do with parsley? I'm sorry? 
Put them in tacos. What else? Garnish. What else? Huh? Tabbouleh. Okay. Eat them. Great for bad breath. Did you know that? If you have bad breath and you don't happen to have some gum around or you have that meal with a lot of garlic, you guys always wonder why do they sprinkle par parsley on, on pasta? It's to help. So if you're, you know, hot, just a leaf, pop it in, chew, you're good. Okay? So parsley has multiple purposes. It's an herb. You can dry it. Okay, you can just chop it up and add it to whatever you're doing. Okay, you can eat it raw. You can saute garlic and onions with it. It adds another flavor profile. So for the vegetables, I just chopped it. We call, we call it in the industry rough chop, where you just chop the stems and everything up with it, and you add it to the whatever you've cooked, okay? Or you can take it off of the stems, just like that, okay? And you can just have it like this in a salad, okay? You got options. So what I did was I just chopped everything and threw it in the threw it in with the uh, with the vegetables and cooked it. When I was done, I seasoned it with a lemon. Okay, two things with lemons: great flavor enhancer, adds a different flavor profile. But most people don't use the zest. Okay. If you don't, if the juice is too much for you, some people can't have that acid because it tears their stomach up. If that's too much, you can always use the zest, okay? And the zest is about this much. You see that white part? You don't want that. You just want the yellow, okay? So run, one run over and you get, you get this much. I'll just walk it around. You guys can look at it. I won't point the knife. So when you run it through the zester, that's all you got. And if you touch it, it has, touch it. Rub it together, smell it. What do you smell? Just lemon, right? Yeah. So, I mean, just a nice, easy zest on it, right? And you can just toss this just like that. What I did was that I just folded it into the, the cooked vegetables. Then the little ground green peppercorns right here. It's just green. Who's ever used green peppercorns? Who wants to know what it looks like? Give me a hand. Smell it, what does it smell like? <laughs> like pepper. Green peppercorn. No, only sneeze if you put up your nose. Don't do that. It's peppery, right? But, it's, but it's, it has a strong smell, it's potent. It's not like the black pepper that we use. There you go. That's how we start with the kids. Get them going, we're good. So that's, uh, that's green peppercorns, right? You want some? You sure? <laughs> so that's pretty much it. Oh, last but not least, least but not last, fancy, fancy salt from France. Kosher salt works just fine. The reason why I use this, because I need it to. Because you guys are worth it. But it's just, it's just salt. It's nothing fancy to it. It's just salt, you know? It's just not like Morton salt, where they add um, vitamin A, I mean, vitamin A, iodine to it. This is just pure sea salt, okay? 
It adds a different flavor profile and I used a little grapeseed oil. You guys ever use grapeseed oil? Grapeseed oil. There you go. Grapeseed oil works great for the skin and it's good to eat. Yes, sir. Grape seed. No, grape seed oil. Here, you can read that, right? All right, so seeds from grapes. Crush them, you got oil, okay? So the beautiful thing about this is that you're trying different oils. Now you guys are probably going, what else am I gonna use grapeseed oil for if I buy it? It's another, I look at it as arrows in your quiver. Okay, if you shoot a bow and arrow, the more bows you, the more arrows you have in your bows, the more damage you can do. For me, as a chef, yes you can, yes you can. For me as a chef, the biggest thing is how can I cook healthy and make it taste good? Because we're so accustomed to Lowry seasoning salt, right? All those beautiful, lovely salts they have out there that we have been introduced to. Okay, my goal is to reduce the usage of those. Okay, healthy stuff, as natural as the product is going to be, and different oils. So you got grapeseed, now they're pushing extra virgin olive oil, olive oil. You can even find extra virgin fancy olive oil in the 99 cent store. I went in there, I was looking, I was walking, I was like, what? That's the $18.99 bottle of, you know, olive oil. What is it doing here? Picked it up. Oh, it's about to expire in six months. I'm good. I got six months to use it or three months to use it, right? But because I use so much olive oil, I'm using it, okay? I also use the oils that make a blend. Canola oil, 50%, olive oil, 50%. Put that together. If you like stir fry, that's what you use it for, okay? If you like frying your chicken, me and Yardbird have a loving relationship. It has never let me down, never broken my heart. So I have a, a soft spot for it in my heart. So I do 75% canola oil, 25% olive oil, and I that's what I use to fry my chicken. I don't use vegetable oil. I don't use peanut oil. I don't use the one you get from Smart and Final. It's like 25 gallons of something. I don't use that. But when it's fried chicken, it's like two pieces. Unless I have company, right? And it's gonna be four pieces. Because you can't just have one piece. You're telling yourself a lie. So I have two and I'm good. So with that being said, using products in its natural form and just trying to use that to add more flavor to what you cook, okay? So how many people boil their vegetables? And you boil them till they are what? Everybody eats different. I'm not passing judgment. I just wanna know. So they're soft. How soft? That you gotta apply pressure or you, with your teeth or pressure with your tongue? With your teeth, okay. Once you start applying pressure with your tongue and it just blends into your gums, you're not a baby. You need your teeth, you need your jaws. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to chew, that tells your stomach that I'm not full yet or I'm full. Try this experiment. Make some mashed potatoes, season it the way you like and just start eating it and see how much of that you consume before you're full, okay? Then make a salad, the same amount, and start eating that salad and see how long it takes you to finish that salad before your stomach says I'm full. You will consume three times the amount of mashed potatoes than you would salad, because what are you doing? 
in your mouth, spoonful in your mouth, apply pressure, swallow, right? Right, you're full, but three quarters of the smashed potatoes are gone. So the using of your jaws communicates with your brain to your stomach that, hey, we're good, jaws are tied, we can't eat no more. Shut it, shut it down. And you know, drink two glasses of water, you're full for the next four hours. And you have your next meal, okay? So, vegetables, activity, are big. Priya, could you please uh, grab that tray and let's pass some of those lovely goodies? So while she's passing those out, I'm gonna do a quick demo. It would help if I put the gas in right, right? So we can have some fire. You guys use one of these burners before? These are great for camping. Or dorm room for you, you students. When I say dorm room, that don't mean put it next to the curtains. So the gas comes in these little, these little containers, butane. We just slide it in. This is a brand new burner, so. <laughs> look at that beautiful flame. I can cook a six, six course meal on this burner. Mr. Show Off. So, I'm using a frying pan so you guys can see. Okay, normally I'll do this in a pot. No, it's H2O. There you go. In which form? There you go. You got it. How many forms does water take? Liquid? Gas? What else? Solid, ice, all right? What do you mean? I'm telling you. So when you show up to science class, you can, when your teacher starts feeding you something else, you can check him or her at the pass. Nah, that's not what the chef told me. He said it's three forms, liquid, gas, and a solid, right? So what I'm gonna do is clean this this cutting board real quick. I will show you the quick the quick 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 cuts. So, cuts in the kitchen. There's two main cuts that we use in the kitchen, small dice, large actually three main. Small darts, blah, 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 blah. small dice large dice, medium dice, right? But there's one that we don't use in the kitchen at, as home cooks or home chefs, whatever title you wanna take. It's called a rough chop, okay? I'll show you how to do a rough chop. My water's boiling. What am I gonna do? My water's boiling, what am I gonna do? My water's boiling, what am I gonna do? Eggs? Put salt in it. Where are the eggs? You brought eggs? You want to boil some eggs? All right, when you get home, do that. So we put a little salt in there, right? Our fancy salt. So, carrot, half a carrot. I cut it in half. I cut it in quarters. Okay, now you guys see how I hold a knife? You see people holding a knife here? I hold the knife right here. I have more control of the knife. How many people can do this with their knife? Not too many. So you wanna hold the knife right here and keep it in your fingers, right? And it works great. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's a rough chop. You guys see that again? 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's a rough chop. You see what I'm doing? I'm taking the product, the carrot, going down, then turning the knife around. I am moving it around and I'm getting not so perfect shapes, okay? But they're bite size. Every time you cut something, you wanna keep it at bite size, okay, or smaller, depending on what you're gonna cook. The smaller ones cook faster. So I put it at bite size, okay? So we got the carrots ready. That's it. Now, because I cooked all the, so what do you guys think? Vegetables, blanched, just like that. That's it. That's it. So we do the same thing with the squash. Now you see how the knife is moving right through the product? Do you know why? Because my knife's a sharp. Now, do we cut ourselves in the kitchen because we have a sharp knife or a dull knife? No. Ah, a dull knife. That is absolutely correct. Do you know why? Do you know the physics behind that? Tell me. Close. But the reason is, if it's not sharp, what do we do? We apply more pressure, right? When you apply more pressure, the knife slides off, nicks you or cuts you, okay? We don't want blood in our food. It's not a good look for us, okay? So, how long has the carrots been in here? A couple minutes? About one minute, about two minutes? Let me see. Almost there. So I don't know what kind of stove you have. It's electric, it's a gas, but you know your stove better than I do. So make sure you keep an eye on it till it reaches that right texture. I say two minutes, but literally it's gonna be a minute. I'm gonna pull them and put them in the water to cool down. Then I'll let you guys, oh, you guys, you got the sample, so you're good. Once I pull the carrots out, I'll do the squash, set the carrots aside, set the squash aside till everything is done. Then I combine it all, okay? So while that is doing what it's doing, We'll take the flat leaf parsley. Now you see how I just take the parsley, I fold it in half, okay? Then I go down real fine. Okay, you guys see that? So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna start to build my, I call this my Sunday vegetable medley. I want to keep the water because I'm going to do the same thing with the uh, squash. Now, once you hit it in cold water, it stops the cooking process and keeps the vegetables bright instead of dull. Because you know, sometimes you cook your vegetables and they just look dull. That's how you have it. All right, we'll let that come to a boil, then we'll do that. I'm gonna mix everything in here. I already got some of the stuff cooked already. So I'm just gonna add that here. We're gonna put a little bit of that. Some zest. I Always zest first, then I juice. Ah! Having issues with the cork. 
Just a little. That in there, green peppercorn. Just a little pinch, you don't want that much. You know when you watch the TV show, they have all their little beautiful spices, everything in a little bowl. Sorry, we're not that fancy yet. So this is what it looks like. You see all the ingredients, that's the juice, that's the zest, with your vegetables cooked already, right? And by the time you mix it all together, you know, you have, you know, you have what you guys had, right? So I like to use different colors, herbs and spices. It makes the meal look alive. Not, you know, dull, like everything looks yellow, or everything looks gray, or everything looks dark. But there's different colors in your meal. Different colors in your meal, so it looks visually pleasing, okay? Visually pleasing. That's it, it's a wrap. I'm gonna pass this around, folks can look at it. This is how it looks when you're done.
continue our day without taking the time to thank our sponsors, Los Madonna's Community Healthcare District. Yay, Bobby. You want to come up for a minute? Uh, we also had Supervisor for the Federal Glover's Office and the Keller Canyon Mitigation Fund that also helped to sponsor this event. John Muir, Sutter, uh, Pittsburgh Unified School District, Rotacare that's doing our health screening, La Clinica that's doing our dental screening, and we just want to take this opportunity to thank you for um, coming out and helping us to sponsor this event. So Bobby's going to come from Los Madonna's and just share a few words. Thank you, Bobby. What an awesome event this is. You know, it gets better and better every year. On behalf of the Board of Directors for Los Madonna's Community Healthcare District, this is a feast of health and wellness. And I just so thank our collaborative every year for putting on the most awesome experience for our community. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Bobby. And um, I also want to also take the opportunity to thank our local officials that are here. We have representatives from Jim Frazier's office. You want to wave your hand? You have. You can come up and you want to share a few words. Okay. And then we have representatives from Supervisor Glover's office. And also we have the uh, Assistant Mayor, City of Pittsburgh, Pete Longmire. You want to come up and say a few words? Speech! Speech! <laughs> we also have representatives from Susan Bonilla's office. Are you here? Not yet? So we want to thank you for coming and supporting us. It means a lot for you to come and support the community. So we have Assistant Mayor Pete Longmire that's coming up to share a few words. Thank you. I just want to say that um, this is an awesome program. This program is awesome. Thank you very much for hosting this type of program within our Pittsburgh uh, community. This is this type of uh, symposium and forum is something that's really, really important to us. The more that we keep our health at the forefront of, of our daily activities, of our lives, and of our, and, and of our communications with each other, the more healthier people that we are going to be. We have a long way to go. We can do this thing. We can lower our blood pressure, get our cholesterol in order, and we can be healthier so we can live longer. We have to teach our youth how to eat how to care for themselves so they can care for our grandchildren and other generations to uh, come. So thank you, enjoy it. A lot of good resources here, and I appreciate it. Welcome. All right, Pete. Thank you so much. All right, Pete. All right, you ready to get started? We are going to start open up with our Zumba Fit. So this is the day of we're going to have physical activities, we have workshops, we have cooking demonstrations. So I really want to encourage everyone to get involved. So if you have tennis shoes in your car, go get them because we're going to be busy here today. Everybody should be sweating by the time they leave here today. So we're going to start with our Zumba Fit. Zoom line, I'm sorry. See, they gave me the mic, it's just the wrong thing to do. <laughs> So we're going to encourage you guys to come on up and also I want, while they're getting set up here, I also want to make sure that you know that we're having a film presentation of Soul Food Junkies and I really, really, really want to encourage everyone to go and take, a, um, take some time and go see that film. That's going to be hosted by our chef, uh, Chef Roberts, he, and you'll see him later on this afternoon. He's also doing the cooking demonstration. 
And um, make sure you visit all of our workshops. Go see our health screening. And when you came in, you got a program with a passport. Once you visit all of our health uh, workshops and resource tables, health screenings, you get a sticker and you have an opportunity to win a grand prize. That's a Fitbit that also will keep you um, active and you can take your pulse rate and it does a lot of stuff. So it's a wonderful prize and we'll be giving out other prizes and later on throughout the day. All right, come on guys.